So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute online for our Tech in the City series, Four Lost Cities, A Secret History of the Urban Age with author Annalee Newitz, who we welcome back. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at Mechanics Institute, and uh, we are also proud to co-present this program with the Goethe Institute and Gray Area, our longtime collaborators on our Tech in the Series series, series programs. Um, if you're new to Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854 and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, and ongoing author events, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. We have such good news for you that the library is now open five days a week. So come on down, uh, get your books, do your research, hang out in our beautiful Beaux-Arts library. This program will also have a Q&A, so hold your questions and put them in the chat and Anna Lee will uh, engage with you with your questions. Um, okay, so I'd like to introduce our program. Um, Anna Lee Newitz debunks the myth that lost cities were miraculously discovered by modern, modern archaeologists. According to Newitz, she has spent the last seven years talking to archaeologists that no city is ever lost. So she'll be sharing us sharing with us some of her research uh, on four ancient cities and abandoned metropolises through their grandeur, their glory, and their demise. Annalie Newitz is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. She is a founder of io9 and a former editor-in-chief at Gizmodo. Her other books include Scatter, Adapt, and Remember, and the novels Autonomous and the Future of Another Timeline. And Annalie was recently featured on Ira Flato's Science Friday, recommending the best sci-fi books for your summer reads. And you can see that uh, online as well. So uh, please welcome Annalie Newitz. I'm getting um, some kind of screen share. So yes, um, uh, somebody is sharing their screen. I, I um, did send them a private chat. Okay. Uh, it's, it must have accidentally clicked on uh, Mr. Um, I think it's uh, John. John, could you look at the top of your screen and um, possibly stop sharing? You know, you'll, you'll see an option that says stop share, screen sharing. Perfect. There we go. Excellent, stop. thank you. All right, welcome, yeah, Annalie. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, and thank you, Laura, for uh, inviting me to come. Mechanics Institute is one of my favorite libraries in the world um, and certainly in the city. So it's really, it's always a pleasure to come and chat with everybody and tell you the latest odd thing that I've been up to, um, which in this case is um, working on a book that took me about seven years to do. Um, Four Lost Cities was really the culmination of a ton of travel that I did, going to different archaeological sites and uh, visiting the cities, talking to archaeologists, um, seeing uh, for myself uh, what uh, cities look like when they've been abandoned for 500 years or 8,000 years. Um, so what I'm going to do today is just give you a little taste of um, what I talk about in Four Lost Cities. I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple of cities from the past and then um, kind of jump ahead into looking at the future of San Francisco and just leave you with a few ideas about um, how ancient history can help us prepare for the future of our own cities today. Um, one of the things uh, about cities that I find particularly um, interesting and, and moving too is that they are social history. Um, cities are built by collectives of people. Um, oftentimes when you read accounts of city building, you hear things like the king built a road, uh, but we all know the king was busy in his castle being fed by servants and it was actually workers and city dwellers who built that road. Um, and so that was, with that thought in mind, um, I kind of tackled this book uh, with an aim to look at those people who were building the roads and what it meant uh, for them and what their lives were like um, and kind of what it means to have 
uh, a collective enterprise like a city uh, that lasts for multiple generations. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and um, show you some images um, from the oldest city I talk about in my book. And you should be seeing a map of Chitalhoyuk. And this is a, a beautiful map that uh, Jason Thompson made for the book. Um, he normally designs game maps for Dungeons and Dragons, so it has a little bit of a fantasy feel, but it's all real. Um, Chitalhoyuk was a city that um, was- I can at hear it. Hello? Sorry, somebody, did somebody ask a question or? Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> technology. Um, so Chitalhoyuk was a city that was um, at its height about 9,000 years ago. It was in central Turkey, uh, and you can still see the remains there today. Um, and it's, uh, it's a city that was occupied continuously for 2,000 years. So it's a much, much uh, sort of more successful city than San Francisco in, by some measure, because of course there's really only been um, San Francisco as such for a little over 150 years. So um, the way that people lived here, uh, this picture makes it look like, you know, the entire city was, was built around this river, but actually what happened was people lived on that east mound for a really long time, maybe about a thousand years, and then they started to build up the west mound as well. So um, as the West Mound was being built, the East Mound was kind of falling into dust. So you have to imagine that this was a city that changed a lot over time. Um, but one of the things uh, that happened at that city was people were at the height of something that is called the Neolithic period, uh, which you probably heard about. Oftentimes uh, people will talk about it as caveman times, um, which it wasn't. Uh, Neolithic just means new stone age. Um, and the reason why it was the new Stone Age was because we'd had the Paleolithic for a really long time, which was kind of the, the Stone Age, the more modern Stone Age. And then the Neolithic was a period of really rapid transformation where people were using stone tools to do all kinds of crazy things. Um, I'm just gonna show you a few pictures from the dig at Chitalhoyuk when I visited um, back in 2013. Um, so, here you're just seeing people excavating. This was a huge city, and so the excavation looks gigantic. Um, these are just the old walls of the city, and they've built a beautiful shade structure on top of it, so it's not quite as hot to work there, uh, which, believe me, the, the people who are digging this up are very grateful for. Um, these are a couple of um, graves that have been um, excavated. And one of the many interesting things about life at Chitalhoyuk is that people buried their dead under their beds. Um, that was just part of their spiritual tradition. So here um, you can see that this part of the floor was a little bit elevated. They call it a bed platform, the archaeologists who worked there. Um, and so underneath you would have had um, the bones uh, of your beloved elders uh, and ancestors um, kind of keeping you company, I guess. Um, the other thing about Chitalhoyuk was that it didn't really look like a modern city as we think of it. Um, there were no public squares, there was no marketplace, there were no palaces. Um, it was very much like a honeycomb structure with all the houses being roughly the same size and all squished up together like apartments, um, people sharing walls, um, you know, being very, very closely packed in. And the way that people got into their houses um, was through their roofs. Um, so you would climb a ladder to get into the city and walk across people's roofs. And people did a lot of work on the roof. You know, they did cooking up there and um, preparation of uh, various items, making clothes, making weapons, uh, making tools. Um, and then you would descend a ladder to get down into your house. So here's just more uh, houses. This is Ian Hodder, who uh, led the excavations at Chitalhoyuk for several decades. He's a professor at Stanford, and he's showing us all of the layers uh, in the city um, because houses were built on top of houses. And you can actually see this kind of swirling pattern um, in the rock wall that he's showing us. And those, those, um, that pattern, those layers are all floors. And so each time a house 
was abandoned, they would burn the house actually, uh, burn a bunch of stuff in it, tear it down and then rebuild it. And so it would leave this kind of blackened, ashy floor. Um, and we'll talk about that more later when I get to the next city. Here's more layers. This just shows you how deep the city goes. So to get back to this point that I was making about the Neolithic uh, being the Stone Age um, and being this kind of moment of transition uh, for humans who had been working with stone tools, um, one of the things that you can see in this picture um, is if you, this is a very, very deep excavation into part of the East Mound. So you can see kind of how big this excavation is of a very tiny part of the city, but also how deep it goes, because of course the deeper you get, the closer you get to the earliest parts of the city, because the newest parts are on top and the oldest parts are on the bottom. So down toward the bottom, um, I'm not sure if actually it's too clear here, but there's a little stripy stick. Um, and the stripy stick is uh, at what's called the dairy line. And um, archeologists like to talk about that at Chatalhoyok because we have such a nice um, layered structure here that we can actually see a moment in time that they can mark physically with this little stripy stick um, where people start uh, cooking with dairy products, um, which means a couple of things. It means that they had domesticated some animals, namely goats in this case, um, and also that um, we can see a uh, residue of milk in a lot of their uh, cookware. Um, and uh, through chemical analysis, we can see that they were cooking with milk. And actually there's a lot of evidence that they used dried milk and to make instant soup, um, which I think is delightful. I love the idea that 9,000 years ago, people had already figured out how to make instant soup. Um, and this is a really interesting transition for the Neolithic period because um, suddenly you can see all this evidence of how people are engaging in agriculture and animal husbandry. And it's changing people's diets, it's changing their life ways, um, it's changing how they live. People had been living nomadically uh, for tens of thousands of years before they settled down into cities like Chatalhoyuk. Uh, the Neolithic is famously that period when people go through the agricultural uh, revolution and, and start living um, in a settled place uh, their whole lives, um, which is, you have to imagine, would have been just a mind-blowing culture shift uh, for people whose whole belief system and traditions were based on being nomads. Um, and so that little dairy line is a big flag. Uh, it tells us how people were changing uh, at all, in all parts of their lives because of this sedentary life. Um, the other thing that that dairy line tells us is that uh, people started making fired pottery because it was a lot easier to cook with milk if you had a pot that you could put over the fire and leave there for a, a period of time to kind of um, to bubble and you add other ingredients and you add your dried milk um, and you get a nice stew out of it. Um, if you can believe this, before people had fired pottery, um, they had to do things like cook with um, heated stones. So you'd have an unfired clay pot. You couldn't put it over the fire because it would break. Uh, you'd fill it with all your stuff, you know, your um, various items that you're going to have in your stew. And then you would heat up rocks and put them in the water um, or in the stew to heat it up. Um, or you could do things like barbecuing and you could cook over the fire, which they did a lot. They all had hearths. Um, but this was a big shift again having fire pottery really really was game changing for people it was it was kind of like uh, the internet revolution it changed the way people did work um, because they could do things like leave uh, food cooking on the stove while they went off and did other stuff it was a huge time saver for people and so it allowed them to spend more time inventing other tools and becoming uh, more proficient at farming and um, animal husbandry so um before we leave Chitalhoyuk here, I'm gonna just show you a few more pictures. This is a very um, awesome picture of wall painting at Chitalhoyuk. You can see uh, there, there's a um, white plastered wall with this red uh, abstract design. And um, this is everywhere. The whole city is just packed with beautiful designs. Everybody uh, painted their and plastered their walls all the time. Um, 
And um, I just got my house painted this past week and I kept thinking, you know, this is something they did at Chitalhoyuk all the time. They were always painting their homes and, and kind of making them more um, beautiful uh, and more um, livable. Um, and uh, this is just one of the many uh, figurines that has that was found at Chitalhoyuk um, of, an, a, of a revered elder uh, who looks pretty badass there. She's got two jaguars next to her. So she's a pretty commanding figure. Um, and this is what it might've looked like inside of one of those little houses at Chitalhoyuk. Um, there's the bed platform. Um, you see those bull, that bull's head there, that would have been a skull, um, a bull's skull that they plastered and used um, to, maybe it was decorative, maybe it was spiritual, maybe it was both, we don't know. There's a lot of mysteries about Chitalhoyuk. Um, and one of the final mysteries about the city that I wanna mention um, is that we don't completely understand why this city was abandoned, but we do have a couple of ideas. Um, and those are related to uh, how the city went through this really rapid Neolithic change in how people were living. Remember, they're living in a settled way and the kind of tools they were using um, and also the population size because most people at this time in history were living in, in pretty small groups, you know, like around maybe 50 people would be a nice sizable community um, or 100 people would be quite amazing. This city probably had 5,000 or give or take a 1,000 people, uh, 5,000 people living there at once, which would have been just astonishing to anyone at that time who was living in a typical way. Um, and one of the uh, archaeologists I talked to, um, Ian Kite, uh, he thinks that one reason that people may have abandoned the city was that living at that size over time uh, was very difficult for people because they had kind of grown up with values that came from small communities, very small communities that were nomadic. And once people were living in a settled way um, at a large population size, it was almost like- them? Why can't you just leave them alone? Do you need this, maybe? Uh, I think folks, please uh, mute your uh, mics because um, we're hearing a little commentary. Um, anyway, so, um, the, the, so the interesting thing that happens is it's possible, Ian Kite thinks, that um, maybe the social organization of the city um, couldn't keep up with the infrastructure of the city. And what I mean by that is that people at that time had, had made enough breakthroughs technologically to build this incredible place, to live there year round, to do agriculture, but maybe they just hadn't quite figured out how to have a society um, politically that existed at that size. Maybe it was a, a kind of a social or a cultural problem that drove people away from the city um, after they'd lived there for about 2000 years. Um, so for generations and generations, it was kind of working out and then eventually it just came to a stop. And um, people don't really start building big cities in this area again for a about 2000 years after Chitalhoyuk is abandoned. And then we start to see the cities emerge that we've all studied in school, the great Mesopotamian cities of Uruk um, and that have you know these huge ziggurats and big wide streets and, and marketplaces and plazas that we recognize um, in cities today. Um, so there seems to have been a kind of retreat from urban life, um, at least briefly. Uh, and then people return and when they return, they're just, their cities just look completely different. And so it's, um, I think as I take you forward a little bit closer to the present and the future, I think it's interesting for us to hold in mind the idea that sometimes our problem with a city is a social or a cultural problem. And that maybe sometimes our infrastructure and our technology outpaces what we know how to do culturally and, and as a community. Um, Okay, I want to take you to another city before we come into the present. Are you sure you don't need to get out and start over? So we don't keep missing all of this. I don't know why you have to keep touching things. Why you can't just leave things You're alone. probably being heard by these other people here. Fine, um, I don't care. Folks, folks uh, please mute your microphones. 
Thanks so much. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, another city uh, in the book, uh, which is many thousands of years later, uh, all across the all the way across the world. Um, this is the city of Cahokia, which is located today in southern Illinois. It's uh, an incredible indigenous city um, that was built starting in kind of the late 900s, um, so about a thousand years ago, um, and it really becomes quite large um, in around uh, 1050. Um, and at at the time that Cahokia is growing as a city, um, its population is you know, around 30,000 people, which rivals the population of Paris at that time. So it's, it's a very impressive city you know, on a global scale. And um, it's huge. And the reason why I love this map is that you can see uh, how far the city stretched. Uh, it stretched all the way from uh, Southern Illinois through what is today East St. Louis and all the way across the Mississippi into what is today St. Louis. Um, but the part of Cahokia that we think of as the central area, the downtown area, um, is in Southern Illinois. And it's marked by uh, this incredible earthen pyramid called today Monk's Mound. We don't know what uh, the people building the city called it, uh, but they were part of a tradition called the Mound Builders. Uh, they were part of the Mississippian culture, which was a big culture of um, linked indigenous groups that lived all the way up and down the Mississippi. Um, there would have been tremendous cultural diversity among Mississippians, different languages and traditions, but they also shared enough traditions um, that they often traveled uh, to each other's um, homes. And it appears that almost annually, um, people came to Cahokia uh, people from all up and down the Mississippi came to Cahokia for um, partying and for um, spiritual pageantry and um, just kind of an annual get together of, of all the, the friends and families that were separated uh, during the year. Um, and they, the city was built, as I said, around these massive earthen mounds. Uh, Monk's Mound is incredibly huge. Um, I think I have a picture here. This is what it looks like today, uh, and you can climb to the top. And when you get to the top, you can see East, you can see St. Louis all the way across uh, no, the river. Um, it's just incredible, um, and um, it's uh, something that appears to have been built um, very rapidly. Um, the city, uh, when people first arrived there, when the the, the framers of the city first arrived, um, there were groups called the Woodland Indians who were living in small villages along. The Mississippi River, and then suddenly this new group comes in, and they just start building these cra these crazy mounds that are just huge. Uh, Monk's Mound has like the footprint of the Great Pyramid at Giza, just to give you a sense of of how large it is. Um, and in fact, when Europeans first stumbled across the remains of this city, uh, they had a theory that um, the ancient Egyptians had built it. Um, and uh, which turned out to be wrong. They also thought ancient aliens had built it, so that was also wrong. Um, the thing that's really interesting about Cahokia, uh, and the reason why I wanted to bring it up, um, and here I'll introduce you to some of the archeologists that I worked with there. This is a dig that I went to there. Um, I attended uh, the dig actually two years in a row, so I got to kind of see how they progressed. Um, and uh, they were um, excavating near Monk's Mound uh, in a small residential neighborhood. Um, and what they talked to me about, um, the two lead archeologists, um, let me find a picture of them. So that is Melissa Baltus on the left and Sarah Barris on the right. Um, and they are two uh, world experts on this area. And um, they're particularly interested in how the city started and how the city ended. And again, like Chautauhoyuk, Cahokia's ending is kind of mysterious. We're not entirely sure why people left, um, but I'm gonna give you one of um, the ideas that um, Melissa had um, about maybe why they left. And I think it sheds a lot of light on how cities work in the present. Um, but what happens at Cahokia is they, they haven't left behind anything that we recognize as writing. So we don't have any stories from the people who lived there uh, a thousand years ago kind of telling us what was going on. But what we do have is a very detailed city grid. 
And we know that the city underwent, and this is just from people mapping and digging and doing magnetometry uh, overviews of the area and um, looking at the arrangement of mounds um, and understanding how it changed over time. So the city starts out um, when it's first being built uh, kind of looking a little bit like just a bunch of villages squished together. You know, it's a lot of um, small neighborhoods that just kind of get next to each other. But then when the city reaches its height, when it's at its most populated, suddenly we've got that monk's mound right in the center of the city. It's got this huge, huge public plaza right next to it, which clearly is intended for people to come and listen to whoever's on top of the mound, talking to them and telling them stuff. Um, also the Cahokians uh, and the Mississippians generally are a very uh, sports loving society. And so they also play a lot of ball games in that, in that plaza. So it's a dual use plaza, uh, sports and um, political events. And um, so when the grid is um, changed, it becomes a very strict north-south grid with Monk's Mound kind of at the center. And archeologists think that um, that suggests that there was some kind of centralized control in the city. Not only do we see these monumental pieces of architecture that suggest that some people were elevated higher than others, uh, but we also see that someone is telling everyone where to put streets um, and, and how to arrange them. You really can't have a super rigid grid uh, without having some centralized um, authority that's kind of planning the city. So it appears that the city went through a phase of some kind of centralized government or governance, um, or maybe a set of leaders that kind of all agreed to work together. Um, we don't know, but it's clear that, um, that the city's organization really changed. And Toward the end of that period, and this is my favorite part of the story, um, what happens is, I'll take you back to that map so you can see a cool picture of it. Um, so you can see here how there's a fence all the way around Monk's Mound. Um, and that fence is only built toward the end of this period of the rigid grid system when the city seems to have centralized control. So somebody, decided they needed to put a big fence around Monk's Mound and protect whoever or whatever was in there. Maybe it was a ruling group, maybe it was other fancy stuff. We're not sure. Uh, there's no evidence of a big war, so it doesn't seem like they were defending against outsiders. Um, it's pretty easy to tell when there's been a big war. There's usually, you know, lots of burning and um, projectile points and, and you can kind of see the damage. We don't see any of that here. Um, we just see what seems like an effort to keep out the riffraff. And then shortly after we see this fence go up, it seems like the riffraff did get in because that grand plaza and Monk's Mound become a trash heap. And the layout of the city changes once again. And it becomes very, very different. It goes back to being much more of a neighborhood pattern. Instead of having that rigid grid, you start to see houses arranged in a courtyard pattern. Uh, around little courtyards um, that feel again much more neighborhoody. Um, and so it seems like there was some kind of social movement uh, that swept through the city and really changed the way people wanted to live together, uh, changed the way they wanted to build, changed their relationship to this massive mound in the middle of their city. Um, so it's a, it's a very striking um, transformation uh, and it's very interesting uh, from my perspective, if you're thinking about cities as a collective endeavor, to think about what does it mean if the city grid has that much of a change? Um, and what, what does that imply about where the city is going? So uh, before I get to figuring out what might have happened to the city, I wanna tell you about one of the really interesting um, traditions uh, that we see practiced throughout Cahokia so here we see um, Sarah and Melissa. They're deep into a pit here that they've dug uh, with the help of their students. Um, and this is for a big public building that would have been in a small neighborhood area. And it seems like this is an area that came from later in the city's life. So after that rigid grid uh, of the city, I'm just gonna call it the rigid grid time. 
Um, this is back, this is toward the end of the city's life when people are living back in kind of courtyard patterns um, in, in neighborhoods. And this is a public house that would have been surrounded by private homes. So people kind of used this public house for, you know, barbecues and parties and other events. Um, and I'm not kidding about the barbecues, by the way. We found when we were excavating a lot of um, remains of barbecue, like they really liked to barbecue deer. Um, and uh, so I dug up a lot of deer bones um, and actually tasted one. But that's a question. If you, if you have any questions about tasting a thousand year old deer bone, just ask me later. Um, so what they're doing in this picture is called scrying. And they're highlighting areas where they found walls and the circles that they're making on the ground there are where they have found post holes. So places where people sank a piece of wood into the ground uh, to be part of a wall or part of a support structure for one of the houses um, at Cahokia. Um, and the thing that, they, that we find, um, no matter where you're digging, whether it's a public house or a private house, whether it's early in the city's life or late in the city's life, is that when people were done with a house, they would burn it. And they wouldn't burn the whole thing. They were very uh, interested in preserving any kind of wood that was still structurally sound to use for another house. So they would pull up uh, the uh, wood walls and they would lay out uh, various items that were spiritually or personally important on the floor of the house and they would light it on fire. And it's just like um, what I showed you earlier at Chitalhoyuk, where I showed you those layers of the house that had the kind of layers of burning and ash um, over time. You see the same thing at Cahokia, where you know you've hit a floor when you find a layer of ash and you dig through that and then you find the next house underneath um, or the next floor underneath. And so these are houses that are built on top of over time, um, but there's always this ritual of um, what archaeologists refer to as closing up house. Um, and at Cahokia, we have strong evidence that this ritual extended beyond houses. Um, there was this incredible discovery a few years ago um, when a new freeway was being put into East St. Louis. And so, and a precinct of Cahokia was discovered during the dig for this freeway. And so they brought in what are literally called emergency archeologists to rescue everything they could find. And one of the things they found was an entire miniature city that had been burned down in one of these closing up rituals. And it's not a miniature city like a wee itsy bitsy city. Um, people actually built um, you know, small houses that were, um, that had wooden walls, that had like little tiny um, baskets and offerings inside of them. And each of those little houses, um, you know, was, was fairly, you know, it was like the size of an outhouse, let's say. Uh, so they weren't huge, but they weren't tiny. Uh, and there were dozens of them that were burned as if there was some kind of um, spiritual push to uh, change the city itself or some kind of ritual around um, closing up, not just a house, but a whole neighborhood. Um, and this was, again, it was, it was not a place where people had lived. I mean, it was purpose built for this uh, sacrifice or for this burning. Uh, no one had, had lived in these houses, they were fake houses. Um, but I think that uh, this is why so many archeologists are really fascinated with this idea of um, burning and closing up at Cahokia because we, so, we see so many different examples of it and it seems so integral to how people understood their relationship with the city and their relationship with the land. Um, and it also suggests that people who built houses at Cahokia thought of them as having a finite lifespan that built into a house was the idea that it would end and we would burn it down and make way for the next thing. Um, it's very different from like a Western or a European idea. When we build houses, uh, we think of them as like lasting forever. You know, a house is successful if it lasts for hundreds of years and a, a city is successful if it lasts for thousands of years. Um, this kind of closing up ritual suggests that maybe the Cahokians didn't see it that way. Maybe they didn't see houses and cities as things that needed to last. They lasted for as long as they as people wanted them to. Uh, when people were sick of them, they changed the way they were laid out. They changed their city's layout. 
Um, and eventually over time, as the city was abandoned, um, it really seems as if people didn't have any particular, um, they didn't have a fight. They didn't seem to have any kind of environmental problems. Um, archaeologists have searched and searched for um, evidence of flooding or fires or something that might have driven people away. Um, there's no evidence of that. It seems like slowly their neighborhoods got further and further apart. And eventually they were just like, okay, we're done. The city was great. We liked it. Now we're going to leave. Um, and the people who left Cahokia um, probably uh, eventually became uh, part of the Siouan tribes, uh, which we which are you know all across uh, central U.S. and and Canada. Um, and this is uh, and so Cahokia is kind of a an ancient civilization that is the um, the deep tradition for many many tribes in North America. Um, it's kind of like ancient Rome is for Westerners, where like lots and lots of different groups kind of trace their roots back there. Um, and, you know, the city kind of lived on in, in the memories of the people who left, but they didn't feel like it was a big deal to leave. And um, I love that idea. And to finish up, um, to I really want us to think about um, the notion that a city doesn't have to be permanent, and that a city should change to suit our needs over time. And I think that uh, the Cahokians may have had the right idea about that um, in some ways. Um, I wanna conclude by thinking just a little bit about San Francisco and what the future of San Francisco might be like. Um, I have this image uh, that uh, was used uh, recently in an exhibit uh, about um, the future of San Francisco. This is actually um, a pretty old, architectural idea uh, invented by a Belgian architect named Vincent Calibo. And um, it's a floating city. It's called, he calls them lily pads. Uh, and they're for climate refugees. And the idea is that these cities uh, float around. This is his idea for what they might look like in a coastal city. This is Monaco, but um, could be San Francisco. Um, and I think that this is such a great uh, image to think with because it reminds us that the shape of a city doesn't always have to be exactly what we think it might be. Um, and in San Francisco, as we look into the next 100 years or the next 500 years, all we're gonna be having to cope with is change. There's gonna be massive transformations in the climate. Um, we're gonna be dealing with fires, we're going to be dealing with potentially um, flooding from sea level rise. You know that an earthquake is coming eventually. I mean, it's statistically very likely to come quite soon that we're going to have a pretty big um, quake uh, along the San Andreas Fault. Um, so our city is going to be dealing with tremendous physical changes, um, environmental changes, and we're going to have to do something like what people at Cahokia did. We're going to have to change the city grid. We're going to have to change the way we build. Um, and also, um, on top of that, we're going to be having to do a lot of innovation politically and socially. Um, and this is why I want to kind of bring it back as I conclude um, to Chitalhoyuk um, and that idea that Ian Kite had about, he calls it the Neolithic dead end, where people just couldn't come up with a way to live together politically um, at a size that was so big, 5,000 people. I know it sounds silly now, but at that time, obviously quite enormous. Um, and I think in San Francisco, uh, because this is uh, one of the cities uh, that is responsible for many of the innovations in the internet uh, and the web and various apps that are replacing the web, um, you know, I think it's worth wondering um, whether we are at a stage kind of like the people in the Neolithic where we're going to have to invent some kind of new way to live together at the scale of the internet, billions of people talking to each other all the time, or millions of people in one nation arguing together at the same time. Um, we're having to deal with that kind of social transformation at the same time that we're dealing with all of this transformation in our environment. And in order to do that, 
we might have to do things like invent floating cities uh, that sail around um, to help people who have been displaced by climate change or something even weirder. Um, I think that it's really important that as we move into the future, that we remember to think about weird stuff and about how incredibly changeable our cities are um, and how much that depends on the political agreements that we make with each other. So, um, so thanks uh, for listening to me uh, talk about cities. Uh, it was lovely um, doing this and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and I see that people were asking a zillion questions while I was in projection mode and couldn't see them. Um, Pam Troy, our events assistant, will read off uh, the questions that you have in chat. So uh, keep putting them in the chat and Pam will come back and read off a few of them to start. Sounds great. Pam, are you there? I am here. Hang on just one second. Um, I had kind of a question. The, the, first, the first city you talked about, um, and you, you, your theory is that it was, it, was, um, it was basically a social decision for them to abandon the city. Is that correct? Rather than a crisis that came up. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe it was a social crisis, but yeah, I think it, it may have been social. We don't know for sure. I was just, it's just that if you are, you are, uh, have your, the bones of your ancestors in your bed, that, that sounds like a, kind of an attachment to a place or attachment. It just seems that it would, you know, it, that, that just think that raises a whole lot of other, that makes, makes it kind of puzzling. I mean, I, I think that you're probably right. It's just, there, there are crises that will arise that will not be reflected, you know, materially, but it's, it just. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I'm glad that you, brought up the thing about having your ancestors buried in your house, because I think it shows how attached people were to their homes, um, because it's very hard. I mean, it's always hard to leave your home behind, no matter what, but it's especially hard if your home is also a place that you think of as being where you can commune with your ancestors, um, if that is how they thought of it. Um, archaeologists, uh, when I was there, there were a bunch of archaeologists visiting at the same time, and they had this kind of very mannered brawl <laughs> over um, whether Chital Hoyuk, whether the people there experienced an idea of history um, or an idea of um, like cosmology or spirituality and whether the city reflected a historical sensibility or like a spiritual sensibility. Um, you know, there were people arguing on both sides and I think um, really it's both. You know that there, that the city kind of embodied a sense of spiritual history, um, and that it would have taken some kind of cultural crisis to drive people away. And also, it would have been slow. You know, this was a city that people lived in continuously for two thousand years. So, abandonment took place over on the scale of hundreds of years. So it was slowly shrinking for a very long time. Um, and I will say another thing about people leaving: they didn't really leave. The area, like what what um, Ian Hodder says, he was the guy that was running the excavation there for so long. He said that as the city gets smaller, we start to see all around the city on the Konya Plain, uh, which is the area around it, um, all these little villages springing up all of a sudden. And it's like he said, it's like a dandelion scattering its seeds, and like all of these people go live separately, um, but they're still kind of in the same area. And people keep using Chitalhoyuk as a graveyard. Um, so it continues to occupy a very prized place um, among the people who live there. So yeah, I think it was hard to let go, but I think they had, they had to try living at a smaller size again. Well, there's a question from uh, Andrew Og Ogus. Uh, is it possible to know how much time elapsed, time lapsed between the burning down of houses? Is it possible that they were burned when someone died and a new generation built the new house? Um, so, so of course, we see this burning pattern in both Chitalhoyuk 9,000 years ago and Cahokia, which is about 1,000 years ago. Um, and yeah, it's, it seems as if um, people did it generationally. Um, there's one house at Chitalhoyuk 
um, which uh, a Berkeley archaeologist named Ruth Tringham, uh, she did a very intensive analysis for many years of one house to try to understand that life cycle of the house. And it does seem in that case that the house was not burned until the very last person in the family had died and that she was that last remaining person was kind of the matriarch of the family. She was laid on top of the other people in the burial area under the beds. Um, and then the house was burned and then a new house was built on top. And it seems very similar at Cahokia. Uh, people did not bury their dead under their houses at Cahokia. So we don't have a sense of who lived where. Um, in fact, we don't really know where they buried their dead or what they did with them. Um, but we do know that we see that same pattern of a house being used for about 40 years. And then there's a layer of burning and then there's a pause sometimes and sometimes not. Sometimes it's just like, hey, build another house right away burn it, lay a new floor, build it up. Um, so it's maybe it was passed down. Maybe it was a new family would come to town. Um, but yeah, it's, it seems like um, there may have been sometimes a pause and sometimes not between uh, burnings. Well, we have two questions that are kind of similar, um, one from Sinbad and one from John. And I'm just gonna, so I'm gonna kind of give them, you know, throw them at you at the same time. Sure. Um, would, so resource exhaustion was ruled out as a factor and um, famine, attack, environmental disturbance, all of those were, were, were categorically ruled out as, as, as factors. This is, it's, these mm -hmm. things did not happen. Okay. So they both were, both were asking about that. And then Daniel Ransom asks, while Catholic is too ancient to connect to any modern culture ethnicity or ethnicity, the people of Cahokia have living descendants today. Have the archaeologists working in Cahokia had dialogue or involved indigenous, pe indigenous people in their work? Um, yeah, so uh, yes. I mean, the, the thing about um, Cahokia is that, um, like I said, uh, it kind of, it's so ancient that it doesn't actually have a connection to any like living tribe per se. Um, a lot of um, anthropologists, both indigenous anthropologists and uh, Western anthropologists, Euro Europeans and, and various other Westerners um, have surmised that there are a lot of connections between Siouan um, tribes, histories and oral traditions and some of the iconography that we see at Cahokia. Um, and there is some hint in the oral tradition that people uh, in Siouan tribes um, trace their lineage back to a city at the fork of two rivers, uh, which would be the Mississippi and the Missouri. Um, but there are no Siouan tribes that claim Cahokia as an ancestral home. Um, there is, there are a couple of tribes that are um, uh, shepherding some of the mounds so that they, they have stepped into um, to take care of them, but they, again, they don't claim a direct lineage. Um, so uh, are, there are a number of indigenous groups um, that have like the Osage and the Cherokee that use um, the Cahokia State Park for events and that consider it to be part of their cultural tradition. Um, and there's a lot of indigenous uh, archeologists and anthropologists who've worked on it. There's also a number of um, indigenous artists who've incorporated imagery of Cahokia into their work. And I talk about that in my book. Um, and I, I actually interviewed an author, um, Rebecca Roanhorse, um, who recreates uh, a version of, of Cahokia in one of her novels. Um, and uh, in order to kind of show what the indigenous world was like uh, before contact with Europeans. Um, so I think it's, like I said, I do think that it's kind of like Rome for the Europeans in that, of course, yes, there's Italians and they can say that they are, you know, whatever, descended from Rome, but Rome was a really different place um, 2000 years ago. Um, and a lot of people who lived in Rome did kind of scatter uh, throughout um, or lived in Roman colonies kind of scattered throughout Europe. So, um, so it's really complicated. It's complicated to, to follow a direct line between Cahokia and, and a single modern group. Um, and that's actually kind of cool about it. I, I think it um, makes it a more um, uh, haunting and profound kind of city because it, it's the sort of um, 
it's the it's the sort of spiritual and historical beginning for a whole bunch of different cultures. Um, and uh, and then the question that someone asked before about cities move on due to like famine attack and environmental disturbance, um, you know. With Cahokia, like I said, I, there's none of that. With Chital, Hoyuk, um, there were periods in the city's history when they had um, massive droughts and um, the climate did change uh, radically over time. And there's actually evidence that people kept living there and they just changed the kind of things that they ate um, based on changes in weather patterns. So they seem to have survived a lot of that stuff and then left for other reasons, which is kind of cool. Okay, or Armando says, thank you, Annalie. That was a really great presentation. As we think about the future, about what cities might be like, what other novel or weird ideas should we be thinking about in terms of city design or layout? Um, that's a great question. And I hope that you guys will come up with some answers. Um, I love the idea of mobile cities, which is why I uh, showed you guys those lily pad cities, the floating cities. Um, I don't know how realistic those are, especially given how um, unappealing cruise ships are right now. <laughs> and I feel like these cities are maybe just giant cruise ships. So, um, so that might be more of a model to think with, but not necessarily something we would actually do. Um, but I do think it's worth uh, exploring the idea of temporary cities, um, cities that are not intended to last, cities that are intended to uh, host people for a generation or two, and then um, biodegrade as, as conditions change so that people can move further inland or further north or whatever um, we need to do uh, to suit the environment and suit ourselves. Um, I am particularly fond of some of the incredibly weird visions coming out of this New York based um, group called The Living, um, like living room, but just living. Um, and they are a group of um, architects who have been experimenting with using building materials that are alive. Um, so whether they are um, alive because they're built with um, biological materials or semi-biological materials, or they're kind of alive because they're smart in the sense that they um, are programmable. Um, so you could have things like uh, a city where um, you had a building that could, whose walls could repair themselves, um, uh, or uh, whose walls were uh, semi-permeable, so they could allow in rainwater and store that rainwater for use later. Um, they could be, um, you know, allowing in cool air and letting out warmer air. Um, there's also the possibility that you could have these kinds of living cities that have huge parts of the downtown devoted to um, animal migration. So animals don't get uh, stopped at the border of the city. They're welcomed in and it's like, here's a road. Did the antelope need to come through? Go for it. Oh, are there moose here? That's great. We've got a moose road. That's awesome. Um, you know, I mean, we probably wouldn't be able to talk, tell the moose that, but we could sort of gently guide them <laughs> down the road. Um, and so I think uh, imagining ways that we could make cities more like living organisms, more like things that function within the ecosystem. Uh, cities are already ecosystems. We know that they're full of living things. They're full of humans and non-human animals and trees and um, all kinds of stuff. Um, but what if we more purposefully designed them to be that way? Um, and again, design them to be a little bit biodegradable. Like don't, don't worry about your house lasting a hundred years. If your house lasts long enough, for you to live there your whole life, that's awesome. It doesn't have to last longer than that. Um, let the next people build a house that's more sustainable. Um, I really like that idea. Sinbad asks, do we know where the earthen material to build the mounds was sourced? That is a super good question. And I have a very big answer for you that I will try to squish down <laughs> into a little answer. Um, yes. Uh, the um, city is actually built out of mounds and also depressions in the earth, which archaeologists call boro pits. Uh, and they call them boro pits because it's literally where people took the earth, borrowed it to build the mounds. Um, and archaeologists believe that uh, the spiritual um, system that people adhered to at Cahokia involved um, thinking about 
the world above, the world on land and the world below. And so there would have been um, significance to uh, areas that were below the earth as well as areas that were, were above. Uh, we know the Boro pits um, filled with water every year. Um, and in fact, some of them still do. <laughs> um, and uh, actually right outside uh, the Interpretive Center at Cahokia. And if you go, I highly recommend you visit um, the Interpretive Center, it's very nice. Uh, there's a big borrow pit right out front and it's always full of stagnant water and people are always grumbling about it, but that's the architecture of the city. Um, and the thing that's so cool is um, there was a small excavation in the side of Monk's Mound where um, archeologists were actually able to see the basket mounds of dirt that people had brought, dirt and clay, because you could just see these little round areas of different colored dirt and different kinds of clay. So we know that they brought it in with baskets. So they'd scoop it out, carry it with a basket, dump it and pat it down really hard so it would be really packed earth. So yeah, it's it seems like moving earth around was actually a big part of spiritual practice. It sounds really tiring to me, but. <laughs> Okushe <laughs> asks, is there DNA remaining in the city that could be linked to today? Um, so not at Cahokia. Um, the area around Cahokia, if you haven't been to Southern Illinois or in that area, um, it's called the American Bottom. Um, and uh, it's very, very um, humid and damp and muddy. And it's very bad for preservation of uh, genetic material. So we do have a few uh, human remains that were excavated uh, before regulations preventing us from excavating uh, the ancestors of indigenous people, um, which was a much needed law, I'm very in favor of that. Uh, so we have very few human remains at all um, for good reason. And the few that we have are not in any shape to do that, which is um, uh, kind of disappointing, but we can't. And at, um, at uh, Chitalhoyuk, um, there has been some loose talk of doing some DNA sequencing. I don't think they're there yet, um, but I think it might be possible. The preservation there might be better, but it hasn't happened yet. So it's definitely stay tuned. I think that would be super cool to find out, especially at Chital, um, who these people were. Um. Sinbad also asks, have any connections been established between the Cahokian mound builders and the serpent mound tribes of Georgia? Yeah, this is another really good question. Um, so uh, North America has a really long tradition of mound building. It goes back about 5,000 years. Um, there have been different um, phases, like different cultures have arisen that seem to really love mound building. Um, it seems almost certain that the people at Cahokia would have seen the remains of these previous mound building civilizations and were probably trying to imitate them. There's no um, evidence that they're connected. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're separated by like a thousand years um, and in some cases by, by three or 4,000 years. So it would have been kind of like, um, you know, the way that the US Capitol is designed to look like an ancient Roman building. Um, you know, there's parts of the US Capitol that are classical Roman architecture. Um, that's probably the kind of thing that was going on at Cahokia where they, the Cahokians were like, oh, there's this ancient tradition of mound building. These are our venerable ancestors. If we're gonna build a super badass city, um, let's do it like that. Let's like, let's, you know, revive these ancient uh, super cool um, traditions of these other successful civilizations. So it was definitely in homage, for sure. Um, Dustin asks, do you think we'll see more cities becoming like Venice with streets turning into canals? Uh, it's a good question. I think we will see that whether we want to or not. Um, I mean, you know, whenever we have, um, hurricane season, you know, a lot of cities in Texas become like Venice, even though they don't want them to. Um, and, you know, of course, cities in Louisiana and Florida as well. So um, I think the question is whether we're going to keep pretending like that stuff isn't happening and just letting our cities 
flood uncontrollably every year, or if we are actually going to say, hey, guess what? Floods, they're gonna happen every year. Why don't we build canals? Um, why don't we build houses on stilts? Why don't we rebuild cities in a different place? Um, and that's the big decision point that we're at right now. That's why I think we're kind of in a new Neolithic, a neo-Neolithic, um, where suddenly we're having to change really fast um, as a civilization to kind of meet um, the needs of our people. You know, we, we can't just sit here and say, all right, well, California is going to burn down every year, whatevs. You know, we have to start um, really intervening, right? And, and you know, doing um, what we can to prevent that kind of stuff from happening. I'm sorry to switch from floods to fires, but fires are very much on my mind right now um, as a San Franciscan, so. And Don Fox asks, were there any excavations of the mounds? If so, was anything discovered? Yeah, so there was the excavation that I mentioned at Monk's Mound where they discovered the basketfuls of dirt and clay. So they discovered like how the mounds were built essentially. Um, there was, um, back in the 1960s, uh, there was an archeologist um, named uh, Melvin Fowler who uh, excavated a mound at Cahokia. Again, this was before the regulations around um, excavating indigenous uh, remains. Um, so he was allowed to just do what he wanted. Um, and he excavated uh, the brilliantly named Mound 72. <laughs> Um, and Mount 72 is special because it had a peaked top. Uh, so it's a top that looked like a, a rooftop. Uh, it would have looked a lot like the rooftops of the houses that people built at Cahokia. And he had a sense that that meant that it was probably pretty special. Um, it was also located uh, directly south of Monk's Mound, I believe. So it's on that north-south grid. And um, yeah, they discovered um, some pretty incredible stuff, uh, some human remains. Um, it looks like um, there would have, that there were kind of um, uh, human sacrifices that went along with some of their festivals that they had. Um, so some of the remains they found uh, appear to have been sacrifices. Other remains they found um, appeared to be uh, the bones of ancestors that had been disinterred and brought specially to be reburied during this whatever the ceremony was where they created this mound. Um, they found tons of offerings in that mound, um, piles and piles of just beautiful projectile points. Um, the people at Cahokia were kind of famous up and down the Mississippi for making these just, just gorgeous uh, projectile points with really beautiful detailing, very thin, um, probably very deadly. Uh, and actually archeologists who were excavating at cities, at mound cities, uh, very, very distant from Cahokia find these projectile points. So they know that people went to Cahokia, you know, picked up a souvenir uh, and brought it back home because they were so cool um, or so significant. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so Mound 72 yielded a lot of stuff. Um, uh, the other mound <laughs> that was excavated um, was in St. Louis. It was called the Big Mound. It was about as big as Monk's Mound. Uh, and in the late 19th century, St. Louis wanted to build a railway and they wanted some landfill for under the railway. So they were like, oh, well, we don't need that mound because that's just Indian stuff. So they dismantled the entire mound. Um, they destroyed tons and tons of beautiful artifacts. Um, there are accounts from the time of people finding incredible jewelry and human remains and all kinds of figurines and um, they just, tossed it in the garbage and that mound is now landfill under the uh, railway station. So, um, so that was not cool. Uh, and, uh, and now um, it's very rare that people excavate mounds because they are very concerned about not disturbing human remains. Uh, it's pretty clear that not all the mounds do contain human remains, but we don't know which is which. And so people, like I said, are very, very careful about doing it. Laura, I think you had a question. Laura? Uh, Annalie, yes. I, I've had a question because I've been thinking a lot about the, the COVID, our COVID year and the change in our workforce, moving out of the city, 
uh, changing and dropping out of the workforce and whole, all of these shifting uh, patterns that are happening, lack of certain workforces in different areas in the city. So I'm wondering if you could talk more about um, um, Angkor, because there was a mention in your press materials about how Angkor had a unsustainable workforce. Was that too little, too much? And just a reflection of, of what we're going through right now with uh, employment and the workforce in San Francisco. Yeah, that's a, um, a really good question. It's a, it's a big answer. Um, so again, I'll try to, I'll try to be brief, but um, one of the things I found in looking at all four of the cities that I talk about in my book is that a big question that keeps coming up is who were the laborers? Um, who were what we call now essential workers? Like who were the people um, doing the building? Who were the people doing the cooking? Who were the people doing the farming? Um, the people who were essential to the city's functioning. Um, and then how were those people treated? Um, and at Angkor, which was a massive city that was um, uh, a going concern right around the exact same time as Cahokia, uh, it's located today in Cambodia and um, a thousand years ago was a part of the Khmer Empire, which stretched across big parts of Southeast Asia. And um, we do have uh, writing from Angkor, so we have a lot more information about how the civilization saw itself. Uh, and a lot of that writing deals with um, labor and how people were uh, put to work, when they were put to work, how they were put to work. Um, uh, Angkor had a system uh, very similar to our debt system in the States, uh, which is called debt slavery. Um, so instead of owing the bank money for your whole life, instead you would owe the king or the temple uh, labor for your whole life. So you would spend a certain amount of every year providing free labor uh, as tax. Um, to the city. And um, some of that labor was actually, you know, I don't think there's not a lot of evidence that it was horrific labor. Like some of it involved bookkeeping and art, um, making statues. Some of it was backbreaking, ditch digging stuff uh, and, you know, farming and things like that. So it wasn't all super fun. Um, and it seems at, at a place like Cahokia, we were just talking about how did people build those mounds? Well, they were building them by lifting baskets of dirt. So that's pretty hard labor. Um, there's a big question around how people were inspired to do that. How do you get a bunch of people to build giant mounds? Um, Backbreaking labor takes like 30 years to build a mound, um, a, a mound of the size of Monk's Mound. Um, so one of the things we see, the pattern we see emerging, if we can talk about a pattern over 9,000 years is that uh, cities tend to get abandoned when the essential workers are mistreated. Um, and mistreatment can be anything from, you know, exactly what you'd expect, things like enslavement um, and, you know, inability to control where you live and what kind of work you do, um, to other problems, uh, problems with, um, you know, where people worked, problems with, um, you know, uh, availability of um, resources for workers, um, problems with uh, rights for workers uh, in, in Pompeii, which I talk about. We have lots and lots of information about the laws that governed uh, enslaved people and freed slaves that, um, you know, make it clear that they were not treated very well. Um, at various points, they were mistreated, and at various points, they had a little bit more rights. So, um, when we look at San Francisco, when we look at the future of cities, I think it's very important to be thinking about who are the essential workers, who are the people that are maintaining the city, and what kinds of uh, how are they how are they being treated? What kinds of rights do they have? What kinds of resources do they have? Um, because if they are mistreated over periods of time, they will abandon the city. Um, and abandonment can take a lot of forms. Like one form of abandonment can simply be gentrification. If you're priced out of the city, from the point of view of history, it still looks like you're abandoning the city, even if you're doing it in reality quite reluctantly, right? Like if you're booted out because your landlord forces you out, you're still abandoning the city. Um, so gentrification is a big danger sign, actually. It's, it's a sign that a city could potentially start forcing abandonment. Um, and so that's why, of course, gentrification is such an, inc an incredibly hot political issue. 
Um, there's a question from Carol Verberg. Talking about the future, you refer to a we that seems to not really exist right now. Do the smaller past civilizations show more consciousness of interdependence, which enabled group policy decisions? I don't see a way into e.g. disposable cities as long as private property trumps any sense of the commons. Yeah, Carol, you are right to call me on saying we as if there's some magical we that, uh, you know, agrees on everything. I mean, that's, uh, it's definitely right to say that that's not, that's not a real thing. Uh, it's never been a real thing. All of the cities that I looked at um, were very diverse. They were full of people from all over speaking different languages. Um, one of the uh, pieces of continuity throughout history is that cities are built by immigrants. And there's a lot of different ways that we know this. Um, and uh, a lot of it has to do with new science around chemistry that allows us to see um, where people were born versus where they died. So it can tell you if they traveled a long way to, to be where they are. Um, and indeed, a lot of them did. Um, so the question is, yeah, how do we get to a provisional we? How do we get to some kind of sense of a a community or a public that shares a, a political will to improve a city or to make a city more livable uh, for everyone in the city, not just for the fancy rich people. Um, and that's why I kind of emphasized in what I was talking about the problems around politics and the questions around politics and how politics shape a city and also how politics can lead to abandonment of a city. Um, I think it's, especially here in San Francisco, because it's a city of engineers and technologists and artists, we think of um, progressing to a better world, meaning like, let's build something, we'll build it, we'll be better, we'll build it better. Um, and um, sorry, I'm doing a presentation, <laughs> sorry. Um, and uh, we think of, um, you know, that it's just a matter of like physically rebuilding things, but it's not, right? It's a matter of um, reimagining our political relationships to each other. And so I'm hoping that as we move into the future of San Francisco and the, fu the future of, you know, the West, let's say, um, that we have an opportunity as we're rebuilding our infrastructure to think about how we want to rebuild that we um, and what does that we look like um, and maybe coming up with better forms of democracy, new kinds of democracy. Democracy is a structure. We can rebuild it. Um, it sounds scary, but um, might be a good idea. Might be time. Okay, and another one more question from Sinbad. Do I recall correctly that at least some of the mounds were thought to be middens like the local shell mounds? Um, they might be in some of the mound cities. Um, at Cahokia, they usually use trash pits. Um, so they didn't tend to pile stuff. There might be some though. Um, I don't know for sure, but I do know that they did have some pretty intense trash pits. Um, that's one of the things that people have excavated at Cahokia. Um, and uh, Tim Pocketat has a great paper. He, he's the, um, one of the main um, popularizers of archaeology at um, Cahokia, and he's now the Illinois State Archaeologist. And um, he excavated a trash pit that was so rank, it still smelled. Like when he finally got to the bottom of it, he said that there was just this horrible aroma. And they actually found, they found the remains of barbecue, of course, because everybody's always having barbecue parties. But they also found a layer of ants like in the trash pit. <laughs> so that's that's like the archeologist's dream job. You know, let's excavate trash. Oh, here's the ant layer. <laughs> here's the poop layer. Um, so yeah, they, they definitely did that. And they also, um, they they put their poop in the, in like the rivers and in the water. So, um, so actually one of the ways that we know the population of Cahokia is by measuring the amounts of poop in the lakes and the rivers. Um, so the more people, the more poop, so. Um, that's some fun facts for you. <laughs> so I have one more question, and it's from Elizabeth yep. Gronwigan. Fascinating presentation. In your own imaginative pathway, Emily, which came first, archaeology or urban planning? Hmm, I 
I guess urban planning. I mean, urban planning has been going on since cities and villages started. So I think of archaeology as being pretty modern. Like I think of it as being a very Western idea and it, it really gets going in like the late 18th and early 19th century, you know, in Europe. Um, it's really not, it, it's really a pretty peculiar thing uh, that, that we do here and um, not always appreciated for good reason. Great. Well, I want to thank Annalie Newitz for her inspiring views, stretching our minds to the past, present, and into the future with her new book, uh, Four Lost Cities, and which you can you can get those bo the book uh, at in at any independent bookstore such as alexanderbook.com, and also just to remind you that you should be in touch with your local state and national representatives for infrastructure bills because we need it <laughs> we need it for our yeah. survival and we need it for our redesigning and strengthening our cities uh, and our urban landscapes so annalee thank you for being so inspiring as always and um look forward to having you back uh for whatever is next yeah, look forward to Returning in person, hopefully, uh, soon. Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Right. Thank you, everyone. And good night. Thank good you. Night. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. And I guess we can all just say bye. And uh, I will close the doors very shortly. It's good to see everyone. <laughs>